Hi guys, this is Ask the Test Question. No. <laughs> <laughs> Ask the Test Question. That's good. <laughs> we should keep that. Okay. Ask the Test Question. Hi guys, this is Ask the Test Kitchen with. I'm Morgan Bowling. I'm the deputy food editor for Cooks Country. And I'm Cecilia Jenkins. I am a senior editor on Cooks Country magazine. Let's get right into these questions. James E. Mamborg. Ooh, James is throwing some shade. Yeah. Um, use a mixer to mash, make mashed potatoes. Sounds like, sounds as if you really don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> totally understand the shade. It's a little confusion here. Yes. Um, Brian said you can use a stand mixer for mashed potatoes. Do you, right. do you have a, a strong Do you have opinions? Yeah. yeah. I know you have opinions. <laughs> He's got um, lots of opinions. <laughs> uh, I would probably break out the, the stand mixer. You would? And I'd fit it with either a whisk or maybe a paddle, depending on how smooth I wanted them. The more you work mashed potatoes, the more that they will get gluey. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. you can use machines to help you, but you're, you're, you're playing with fire a little bit. Yeah, you just have to be super gentle. Like I feel like if right. you do it, you do it on a really low yeah. speed and you barely do it. There are also some times where you actually want to take advantage of that. Like there's a French recipe called Ali Goat, which actually our recipe uses a food processor instead of stand mixer. But you really want to like um, overwork the potatoes because it makes them actually more like gluey and stretchy. And that recipe is all about getting like stretchy, mm -hmm. cheesy potatoes. Right. So, so it works there, but. Yeah, for your regular mashed right. potatoes, yeah. probably probably just use a regular, I love a potato masher, it's so easy. Yes. Leo Kiosk uh, says, after you're done testing a recipe, how long before you can stomach eating that food again? That's a very good question. I feel like there's like a, a curve based on how many times you test it. Something like Cuban sandwiches might be a minute before you can eat those again. Yeah, I mean, I love them and it's a really good recipe, but by now I've almost worked on that for a year. And, so, and that was like me and brisket. I was like, I, I still won't. I'm still like, I'm okay if anyone wants to make brisket. I actually would rather cook it than eat it at this point. Yeah, and that's when you depend on your teammates a lot mm -hmm. um, because I can get so close to something that mm -hmm. mm, you can't really see the forest from the trees anymore. Like often, so it's like two months or so between when we finish a recipe and it gets shot for the photo shoot. Usually by the time a photo shoot comes around, I'm like, oh, this is good. Yeah. I'm into yeah. this again. Yeah, usually so like maybe like a month later, you're ready to eat it again. Yeah. Regarding your millionaire shortbread recipe, we've now made it to the letter twice. And when cutting into the bars, the shortbread is very crumbly and it's quite hard to make. Any advice for troubleshooting? I feel like a lot of it is like how you pack it in. Like mm. it has to be really well packed to avoid it crumbling. Okay. You have to like really press it down. And then also in the kitchen when we do it, and I can't remember if this is written into the recipe or not. I think it is, but it might not be. Um, we often will use a serrated knife to cut it which will help oh, a little bit with good, that, too. Yeah, um, but I think packing is definitely where you need to, packing and slicing. Yeah, tips for buying used secondhand appliances. Yeah, I mean, honestly, maybe if you're at your secondhand store, can you just plug it in and see if it works yeah. before you buy it? I know, actually my ice cream maker I bought at Goodwill. It's great, I use yeah. it all the time. So yeah. I feel like they always have ice cream makers there. Those so. are expensive, too. So. They are. Where do you temp a steak? From the side, from the top, we either overcook or undercook our steaks. Okay, if you don't have a thermometer, well, actually, wait, this, never mind. Oh. I was gonna do, I was gonna, I had a different question in mind. Forget oh, I just okay. said that. We <laughs> can answer that question too, let's okay. answer that one too. Well, first of all, if you have a thermometer, which is your question, um, <laughs> I think going in from the side is easier because you have yeah, less. Okay. Um, Does your steak go like this? Yeah. <laughs> If you go this way, you can oh, yeah. e easily hit like the heating element. If you go too close to the pan, it's going to look a lot hotter. If you go too, too close to the top, it's going to look like it's a lot colder. Yeah. But the side, you can kind of get an easier, more specific measurement. If you don't have a thermometer, there is a trick that like a lot of like cooks and restaurants use. And it's kind of vague and you kind of have to get the hang of it. But if you make your hand, like if you touch your thumb to your pinky, that should be mm -hmm. what this feels like should be well done. Mm -hmm. Well done, medium well. Or, I mean, if you can, I would just cut into it. I know that's like kind of an annoying answer. It's harder with like a turkey. Yeah, yeah like cut into the <laughs> whole you're, turkey. Then, you're, then you really need a thermometer, so you might as well just get a thermometer, but. Yeah, you can get them for kind of cheap. B. Rons asks, how necessary are B roasting racks when a recipe calls for one, and what are some workarounds? I have cooked a Friendsgiving without a V rack, and I survived. Yeah, I think you will be fine. Yeah. It's just, the disposable pans often will come with one. It's like they're not very good, but they exist, so mm -hmm. you can always use that. 
I've also propped my turkey up on like balls of aluminum foil. Yeah, I was gonna say like, it's probably not like a scientific answer. Yeah, I have done it. <laughs> Cans or aluminum foil or yeah, something to keep it. You, you can want get creative with yeah. it. Yeah, you just don't want to try, touching the pan itself because then it's like sitting in its own juices and it's not getting as like much air around it and it's not getting crisp. Right. Karen asks uh, recommendations for knife sharpening. You should sharpen your knife as frequently as you go to the dentist, which is usually like one or two times a year. Mm -hmm. That's a good rule of thumb. I've never um, heard that. I mean, if you, for some reason, are like scared to do it at home, you can always take it to a place like Sur La Tab or Williams Sonoma and they'll Hardware do it for stores, you. Mm -hmm. Hardware stores will do it. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, what are your thoughts on silicone muffin tins? They seem to stick for me. What am I doing wrong? I feel like it's never gonna hurt to just spray them anyway to avoid sticking. I think sometimes, especially the more you use them, I know with Silpats, which are also silicone, that the more you use them, the less non-stick they are. So I think it's not gonna hurt you to use some non-stick cooking spray on them. I actually also, just for the record, like don't like silicone muffin tins. I don't think you get as good a browning on mm -hmm. them around the edges. Back to our question about like going to a Goodwill or like a, getting secondhand stuff. I think you can actually buy muffin tins often at like a Goodwill or something like that, yeah. or a Salvation Army or a different, um, thrift store, or you can order our winner online, which I th think is the William Sonoma um, Gold Touch. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, so yes. and those are awesome. So yeah. I think the material really matters personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I mean, probably your best bet if you like make a lot of muffins is to buy those and just use the muffin liners, which are then, um, or actually just spray. Actually, with those, they're non-stick, so you actually don't even need to use muffin liners, but you have to spray it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, sea pickles. Can I really oh, make name. bread with a hand mixer? Dough hook. Hand mixer. Dough I don't hook. feel like you can. Yeah, I would just use either your hands or it's a mixer. It's not stable enough. I'm trying to picture my hand holding <laughs> a hand <stand laughs> mixer. It, it would throw me around. Uh -huh. So I feel like you want the heaviness of a stand mixer. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sink some money into that. No, me neither. This is an air fryer worth the cost in counter space. I think it depends on how much frying you're doing. Yeah. Honestly. I think in our testing, we kind of found that they don't actually like, they're kind of like very fancy convection ovens, which has yeah. a lot of good purpose. You can get really crispy, nice things in them. And our book is really, has a lot of cool recipes. I ate a lot of stuff. I didn't work on that book, but I snacked on a lot of the like French fries and stuff they made while testing. Yeah. But I think it just depends if you're going to use it a lot. Like, I probably wouldn't dedicate a counter space to it because. Yeah, but counter space is so precious in my apartment that like, I don't think I could. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice it, and I also am kind of a purist, and I would want like a real deep fried thing. Yeah, either one like deep fried or like deep fried potatoes or roasted potatoes. Right. I don't want like something that's kind of in between the two. Yeah, but if you like your air fryer and you, and you would use it a lot, then mm -hmm. yeah, like if you have like I feel like if you, you like kids, that if you like that be, texture yeah. and you use it a lot, then I say go for it. Okay, JP McKenna, when pan frying a steak, how do I prevent it from curling up around the edges? Good question. This happens a lot, I feel like, also with pork chops. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, buckling. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could either, well, you could either weigh it down with mm -hmm. something like a Dutch oven. Yeah, and like in restaurants, we always like would hold it down with tongs or like um, a big fish spat or something. So yeah. you're like not actually touching it, but you're using a utensil to hold it down. Yeah, if, and if that's like too scary and the heat is like getting you right here, then I'd say just put something heavy on it. Mm -hmm carefully watch it because you're going to cook a little bit faster. For pork chops, you can actually snip the, um, is it? The the tat, it's the fat, fat that runs around the like chop, that white part. That yeah, because that will shrink and make the pork chop buckle and then you don't get as good browning. So if you release that, then it should be Yeah, flat. you just do little snips yeah. through the white part, like two little snips on different sides of the chop. Yeah. Okay, D. Lee. What's the difference between muffins and cupcakes? I feel like Tucker would love this question. It's a very... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very um, good philosophical question, philosophical question. Um, Is it frosting? Probably frosting. Um, muffins have a muffin top and cupcakes generally don't. Yeah. They just have like a little dome. Mm -hmm. And muffins you eat for breakfast and cupcakes you eat for dessert or snacking or lunch or dinner. I usually think of cupcakes as having a tighter, more fine cake-like crumb. Mm. But I don't know that that's a hard and fast rule. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna I, write I, that into Webster. Okay. I've, yeah, <laughs> I've definitely had like muffins and cupcakes that have the same cakey, cakiness mm -hmm. or openness. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any ideas, yeah. feel free to tell us. We will yeah. probably agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lorena, Lorena, other than in Tom Kagai soup, 
where else can I use Galanga? Um, okay, so that is often compared to ginger, although it is not mm -hmm. a substitute for it. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of piney. And a little citrusy. In um, flavor, um, and it, it has like um, digestive um, benefits, so in that way it's similar to ginger. Mm -hmm. um, but you could steep it in teas. Yeah, I feel like you could probably use it in like some sort, some other sort of soups um, or satays or things like that. Yeah, tea sounds like a very easy option. Yeah, um, you should try it and let us know. Yeah, keep us posted. If you come up with other good options, let yeah, us know. Because that's that's a good question. Um, okay, Lisa McManus. Ah, she. Hi, Lisa. Hi, hey, Lisa. She's somewhere in this building right now. <laughs> um, what's the most difficult recipe you've, recipe you've ever developed here? Oof. Mine was brisket. It's bringing back memories. I know, hard memories. Um, why was it so hard? That, my, that was because, so this recipe is a Texas uh, style barbecue br uh, brisket. Um, and it was this recipe that actually took like two summers to develop. So it was a massive full on beef brisket. It was a 12 pound beef brisket. Um, and we wanted to figure out how to make it work on a charcoal grill when usually they're done on these industrial sized smokers that give you a lot more space between the brisket and the heat source. Uh, so one summer we started it, we got some progress, we figured out this thing called a charcoal snake, which is um, a certain charcoal arrangement that you put uh, coals on the bottom of a charcoal grill and you light one side and it like slowly burns all the way around. Um, we figured that out at the very end of the summer and we're like, oh, this recipe's due. So we ended up swapping in another recipe really fast and holding on to it for a whole other year. And then we came back to it um, and I like figured out the techniques of the snake and everything to like actually perfect the recipe and make it uh, something people could reproduce at home. But it took two summers and almost 500 pounds of meat for me to test that recipe. Yeah, and a lot of charcoal. A lot of charcoal. I was like getting up at like, and also it was an eight hour cook and a three, two to three hour rest. So um, I was getting up at like four in the morning sometimes Morgan, to start these. Morgan would email our team and say, at four in the morning, I've just lit my grills. <laughs> Pork's going on, uh, and then she would bring she, she would bring the actual brisket, brisket in. into work by like three or four o'clock in the afternoon, so we could all taste it and give her feedback. But yeah. it was a twelve hour. It was, it was a basically lot. a twelve hour. It essentially smelled like a charcoal grill for like two summers. Yeah. K Z Marco. Ooh, fun name. Do you eat the failures as well as the successes? Yes, we yes, do. We do. Do you think what's one of the worst things you've eaten here? Um, probably one of the things that I made, which was, um, remember when I, like, sugar steak was my very first oh, recipe, yeah. and I remember, um, it was basically just a little bit of sugar to help the steak brown, mm -hmm. but, um, I remember it was, there were some that were really bad. Yeah, I've been told some food I've made tastes like a foot, and <laughs> I still eat it. <laughs> I have to know it tastes like a foot. Yeah, you mean, it's it's yeah. not all glamorous. There was one the, round of beef pot pie the, I made that for some reason tasted I actually too. remember that. Yeah, so that was a good day. <laughs> okay. Well, this has been really fun. Um, thank you guys for watching. And yeah, uh, please send in your questions for next time in the comments below. It's not us, so send some hard ones. <laughs>